there. Welcome to the BWI Daily Edition. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr, back again for what I think is going to be a really fun and interactive show. I'm joined by senior editor of Blue White Illustrated, Nate Bauer. Nate, how you doing today? Welcome back from your quick trip, your quick getaway. Hello, hello. What's going on, man? I'm, I'm, I'm great, and I'm looking forward to this. I had a, I had a, a quick story. I had a fun weekend away as well. I know you were at a wedding. I was at a bachelor party, and uh, a friend of mine who, uh, all the way back in college, we had, like, you know, just like a bros weekend getaway, and because I'm the football guy, and they love football, we were talking about football the whole weekend, and one guy was saying, you know what, I probably can run a sub 540, and I'm like, no, you can't, you can't run, so long story short, we ended up, after several beverages, going out into the road and running 40-yard dashes, so... Longer story, even shorter, I, I sort of pulled my hamstring, and sitting is a huge pain. So hopefully this is less painful than that. <laughs> Did anyone run a sub-540? Come on. No. No. Oh, man. No. Because maybe somebody was out there, you know, with some talent, a little goodwill hunting situation, you know? Maybe there's an NFL star among you. I well, there was also a pool involved, and I already uh, ruled them all out based on just the physical appearance. So, sure, sure. <laughs> but great guys, we had a great weekend. Uh, but sitting is now a problem because. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was a great weekend. We, I want to get into. <laughs> <laughs> totally off the rails here. Today we're talking about something that I think is really fun. Best case scenario for the Penn State football team coming out of training camp. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at those position battles and some of those key depth positions, and we're going to fill in the depth chart with what Nate thinks is the best case scenario for some of those situations and what I think is the best case scenario for some of those situations. So if you're listening today on the podcast, make sure you uh, do check out our YouTube page, Blue White Illustrated on YouTube, so you can get the full uh, experience of seeing exactly what we're talking about. We'll do our best to describe everything, but just so you can see it and follow along, that's the best place to do that. But speaking of seeing it, this is now here. This is the Blue White Illustrated latest edition, and uh, one of the first stories I'm, I'm coming to, not only Phil Gross announcing that he's uh, retiring from the magazine, and congratulations to him on a 40-year career, but also Nate Bauer right after that with his uh, opinion on what James Franklin meant by what he said. Reading between the lines with James Franklin is an incredible task and one that you're proficient at. Give us a little sneak preview of what that is about and what he said at Big Ten Media Day and what you think he meant. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think the premise of the story is just that uh, as much of what he says is about what he doesn't say, right? Like, there's always a subtext to some of the things that James Franklin talks about. And basically this preseason, if you, if you look at all that he has said about this football team, um, you know, there's some pretty stark uh, contrast between his optimism and his expectation for the program this season against what really existed last year, which if, you know, if we're, if we're looking at it, it's uh, you know, miserable right like that was that was what the actual season was last season what he feels like this team has uh from a leadership perspective experience perspective um you know the i called it the vibe I, you know I, i'm not exactly the aura right like all of those things by talking about them the way that he has gives you a direct contrast to what last year was about, right? The, right. There, it was an, there was an absence of leadership at times. There was an absence of optimism, right? I mean, just the whole, the, the train wreck of the way that the season unfolded, not just on the field, but more specifically off the field, you know, uh, losing a, a guy in journey Brown, who was so important, not just to, what they intended to do offensively, but from a character perspective, right? Like this is a right. guy that everyone likes. Uh, and th yeah, like not only is he out for the season, he, he can't play football ever again. Like <laughs> we, we, we look at that. And I think that from the outside looking in it's, it, there's always kind of that, again, like we're doing this depth chart today. There's always a depth chart perspective to it where it's just like, Oh, well, next next man up and that right. 
they say they say it themselves. I mean, right within within a program, they say it themselves. Next man up. Now, that's that's not how it works. Like these are humans. These are individuals with feelings and uh, stuff like that. News like that is devastating. So yeah. now, the whole thrust of the story is just hey, look at look at all of the things that James Franklin is talking about this year uh, are, are stand in in really stark contrast to what last year was for this Penn State program. So if you want to check out the full article and, of course, everything else in the episode, in the issue of Bluewood Illustrated, it is out now. You can get that or you can become a subscriber because you you get it delivered to you. You don't have to go looking for it. Uh, we'll get to more about that in just a little bit. But as you mentioned, these are people with thoughts and feelings. Uh, and today is going to be a little more interactive. So we are also people with thoughts and feelings. So I would ask that you extend that courtesy to us as uh, we're trying something a little bit different here. Um, we're going to take all those players that we just talked about, and we're going to give our best case scenario for what we think the roster will look like for Penn State this fall. So if, if there is a position battle, what is the best case scenario for the outcome of that? Who is the player that we think will give the best option for Penn State going forward? And uh, then some key reserve players as well, guys that we think need to see either playing time or reps so far in the season. And as always, because this, this is where football starts, Nate, we're going to start with the offense. And we're not going to painstakingly go through all of the obvious things. Um, I want to start actually at running back because I... I know we talked about this last week. You've already filled in Noah Kane. You have decided you have called that running back competition over last week, and you're doubling down on it now. You're just him leading off as the obvious undisputed starter. So why is that the best-case scenario for Penn State? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that if, if he is the version of himself that asserted himself two years ago now, Right. So in the middle of the season, in the right. middle of the 2019 season, that guy had already done enough to win the job. And the the thought is, look, these guys aren't stagnant. Even through injury, they you're either getting better or you're getting worse. Right. That that's the you know the old saying. But yeah, Noah Kane as a as a physical specimen as an athlete is better today and knows so much more about the game than he did two years ago at this time. So yeah, uh, given his place on the depth chart or, or in that room, I should say in the running backs room, he, he is the guy that stands out to me as the one who everyone else has to beat. right? right. It's, it's his job to lose. Um, and so does that mean that he's, you know, the, the, the obvious, Big Ten running back of the year? No, not necessarily. Uh, and it doesn't even mean that he'll be the best running back that they have on the team this year. But right now at this stage, coming back from injury and being in a place where uh, every you know piece of input coming my way is is positive and optimistic, you know, regarding his potential this season. Right. Yeah, he's he's the guy. And, and with respect to John Lovett, uh, who is a graduate senior Noah Kane is still the most physically mature back on the team as well because Kevon Lee a similar situation similar player but he is only a sophomore at this point and as you pointed out Noah Kane was a talented player who was physically dominant as a freshman now entering his junior season so that does make sense and for as much as I, I was kidding around with you uh I also have Noah Kane here as my optimum starter here for the Penn State offense um, I sh oh, I, I got to press I should enter. Say one, I should <laughs> Go for it. I should say one other thing. Uh, we've also been to practice three times, and he's the first guy that gets all the carries. So uh, that seems right. like a, a pretty good, a pretty good tell. <laughs> pretty much a no brainer. Uh, so as you can see, you know, in, in we have some differences, and this is the interesting thing that I want to highlight is uh, the obvious ones are obvious: Jahan Dotson, Rasheed Walker, Mike Miranda, Caden Wallace, Parker Washington, and yes, Sean Clifford are the obvious starters on the offense. Uh, that guard position, let's go there to start because that is an interesting situation to me as far as who are the guys that are going to be either the starters or guys that are going to see key minutes because Penn State typically plays more than just two guards 
during the season. And I know that you have, and, and this is, bear with us here, this keeps uh, taking a little bit. you got Juice Scruggs already locked in as that starting right guard. Who are the other guys you're looking at this position? What's the optimum at that left guard and that key reserve here for you? Yeah, so I don't, I don't, I, I probably have that in falsely. And, and I would say that uh, not only is the Scruggs at right guard not necessarily how they'll go, but it's to me, it's more about Mike Miranda. Um, because if there's another option at center that makes sense to them, and an option at left guard that doesn't make sense. I guess, I guess that's maybe the better way to put it is if they can't figure out left guard, then right. maybe Mike Miranda moves back to guard. I, I'm not saying that that's in any way uh, how, how things have trended this preseason. It's not. Right. Um, I, th I think that Mike Miranda is going to be the starting center, and I think that Juice Ruggs is going to be the starting right guard. But – I'm just saying that's what that's what literally today is about. Right. Uh, you know, the next the next couple of practices, the next week basically is to figure that out because they do have options there. Uh, not just it's it's not just like oh, you've got three guys vying for the left guard spot. It's hey, how how do you find the best combination of the three interior offensive linemen? Right. And and not necessarily pigeonholing yourself into saying, oh, well, just because Juice Scruggs is the best right guard, that that's what it has to be. Right. So, yeah, so, I mean, I, I do think that, um, you know, Anthony Wigan is the um, Wigan. Wigan. I, I I've, I've heard it Wigan more than Wigan. I I, I I was messing up. It's so but but here's the thing. Anyway. We This is, a, I, I think that's fair in the sense that the guys in this competition, because now that we say, if we're saying Mike Miranda has been practicing at center this entire time, so the best case scenario, and that's what we're doing today, is that he's the center. The guys outside of those two that, that you have plugged in, and, and truthfully, I have plugged in as well, it really is completely unknown. We don't have any real information on who they are, what their game is like, and what they can do with, at the college football level. So... With your best case scenario here at left guard between those guys, and I think Salim Wormley is the other name that's been mentioned the most. Who's your best case scenario? Give us, put it in for us, and see, uh, and give us the name you're ready to put in. Yeah, all right. You don't want um, to, do you? <laughs> no, I don't. I, I don't. And here's what I'm gonna do. Okay. Only, only because I'm gonna take past, past decisions that have been made and make that the the precedent okay so i'm gonna give it to des holmes okay because he was the guy who you know if it weren't for injury issues and other unavailability um moments in his career is a guy who would have been on the field much more than we've already seen him and so yeah, if it's if it's between Salim Wormley and Des Holmes and Anthony Wigan, uh, I'm, I'm I'm gonna go. I'm gonna give Holmes the slight edge. So I'm gonna go in a different direction, and I'm glad that we're doing this because this is this is what I was hoping would happen. Um, I think they brought in Eric Wilson for a reason. And that is the transfer from Harvard. He's got three years of starting experience. He does have the versatility, as you mentioned, if there's some reason that he's not working out at left guard, he does have the versatility to play a couple of different positions. I could I could sort of see him playing center if you wanted to move Mike Miranda back to that position. But yep. to me, you've got the starting experience. You want the you want the veterans out there. You want the best possible unit. And I think that's what Eric Wilson fills out to be. The question is, can he do it? Not at the not at the Ivy League, but in the Big Ten. And his his body type, his game. I think he is a good pass protector. I don't know that they'll get as much out of him as you would see uh, from Des Holmes. Um, but I do think that overall, to me, that that might be the best case scenario for Penn State is that they get that guy who they brought in for that specific reason, a veteran who's played. And to me, that's the key part. Uh, for for what they want at that left guard position. So come back to you. 
because I, I do think that they always talk about the best five guys, but they said James Franklin has said you're they're eight deep at times at that guard position. Who's the next guy up that's seeing reps this year? And it doesn't have to be whichever one you think on the interior where they're going to have the most snaps. Could be center, could be right guard, doesn't matter. So we're saying if it's not Des Holmes. No, no, no. I'm saying the next guy in the rotation. So they're going to ro- – Penn State has always typically rotated yeah, at no, least I mean, one more guard. Who's the next guy on the depth chart? Oh, man. Uh, Wigan, probably. Okay. But, All right. But I, but I think – but you're right. Like, Wormley's there, and so is Wilson. So, I, I mean, I, I, I will say this. Uh, I had the occasion to, to talk to Phil Troutwine at media day and he, he made it very clear, like, and not in a, uh, you know, patronizing way that he, he truly wants to have as many options as possible guys mm-hmm. who are ready to play and that can play. And so if, if I'm being blunt, I would say that if there's question in the preseason about what they're doing, then maybe it's a situation where no one stands right. Like, so Rashid Walker is so good that there, there's no question about it. Right. Right. If, right, if right. they're trying to figure out how this shakes out, then the bottom line is they're all going to play. They're right. all going to see time unless somebody, unless somebody really separates themselves. Um, you know, I, I think that you're going to see the first few games be that opportunity to judge and see, who is able to perform in games and who who grades out the best, right? I mean, you know, look, this isn't that complicated. They have a grading system and they grade and the best grade gets onto the field. And yeah. So like, yeah. If there's a big, if, there, if there's a big, if there's a big separation between one and two and two is going to get on the field less, but if there's not, then, then that's how they're going to go. They're going to see those guys rotate. But the interesting, I think that's a, that's a that's a fair point, and they'll let that competition as long as they have equal parts go until someone either does separate themselves or both players play their way into a valid sort of co-starter, as we've seen in the past. Because don't forget, Mike Miranda was in a similar situation with C.J. Thorpe for quite a while, so we have seen that play out for quite some time. I guess I'm taking a little bit of a different look at it because this is something that I want to talk about after we get done with here, and we'll finish up with the offensive line in just a minute. But um, my guy, as far as what the best-case scenario for the program is, is not just now, but it's also in the long term. And I think if a younger guy can step up and command those those rotational reps, Salim Wormley, to me, as a redshirt sophomore, offers more long-term viability than maybe a Wigan or uh, a Holmes who are older and don't have as much time left in the program. This is the sort of thing that I think everyone who who has fun with depth charts, everyone who loves depth charts, they always want the young guy, the promising guy to be the next guy up. And I guess that's kind yeah. of how I look at this particular situation is the veteran up, up top, the guy that has proven uh, college football starting experience, and then a young guy that is ready to grow into a role and and replace instead of we're back in this situation next year with the interior of the offensive line and you don't have any clear-cut people that are ready to assimilate into those roles. One guy that I want to bring up, do you see Landon Tangwall in this conversation whatsoever at any of these positions? Because to me, I want to put him on the depth chart, but I don't know where to put him. Yeah, um, the the two deep, I'm not sure. Maybe the three deep, for sure. And I think that they're figuring that out right now. I think okay. he's been at both. Ta- I think that he's been at both tackle spots this preseason, and I think that he has been at left guard. Uh, don't quote me on that. Okay. Um, Tweeting no, it right but, now, Nate. Oh, <laughs> what a mistake! No, I, but I. I Put it this way: He's seen time at guard this preseason. He, they, the the way I understood it coming into the preseason, it was this kid is good enough to play. Uh, it's just a matter of figuring out how he fills a hole the best. I don't think it's right when when you've got a kid on the offensive line at the very beginning of his his career. If he's not like so good that he's a shoe-in starter, that he has to start day one, 
it's then at that point, it's not about what is his long-term position. It's how can he immediately help the team and the program? Right. And so right. with that in mind, it's all right, this guy has the versatility to be at a bunch of different places. Who, how does he fill that in? Right. right. And so that's, to me, that's, yeah. I mean, can, can you put him on the depth chart? Yeah. Can you put him on the depth chart at a specific position right now? No, definitely not. Okay. So what I'm going to do then for you is I'm going to put in Bryce Effner here because that's the other guy we've heard a, a a lot about at that tackle position as the key backup of that uh, of that kind of swing tackle position. Is that fair? Yeah. No, I think so. For sure. You're going. You're going veteran heavy here. This is so. This is an uh, interesting so thing. Here's I I just listening to you uh, and I didn't want to interrupt, but if I've come to take a position on anything over the last maybe five years, particularly with the advent of the transfer portal, they don't do, and I, I'm not just talking about Penn State. It, it's what I see on the broader spectrum. Coaching staffs want to win right now. Yeah. That's it. There, There is no, yes, is there a future? Yes, do you have to balance um you know, egos and, and get guys involved and keep them involved. Yeah, you have to do all of that. But who gives you the best chance to win this game right now? And so, you know, there are reps to be had on field goal. And on, right. And, you know, like that that's how you get some of those guys involved. Um, because it, it's 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 not about. All right. We're, we're just going to ignore the the senior who's a little bit better than the third year guy, the redshirt sophomore, because, you know, the senior can't help us next year. I, right. I, I just that's a that's a concept that I have seen itself play out so many times now, you know, that it's just like, OK, well, I, I you have to abandon it, at least at least in in my perspective, in the way that. Uh, particularly this Penn State staff approaches those kind of questions. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, you know, I still th I, I think it's and I, I love that we're having this conversation because it does talk about what do you consider the best case scenario? Do you think that Des Holmes and uh, Anthony Wigan are the guys that are the best case scenario that those veterans that are 325 pounds that are physically mature guys, their game turns on and they become the guys that are ready to play or do you think about it in the term you know kind of in the in the team building perspective i'd say is how sure, i yeah, looked right. at it is that right. okay so those guys uh, we've also seen on the other side uh, you know with maybe some deference to seniors of maybe koa farmer was the starter but we definitely saw the most talented player on the field for the most snaps when it came to michael parsons so that leads us yeah. perfectly into this wide receiver competition that's happening the other massive yeah. open hole on our depth chart so i have an idea of what you might say here but what's your best case scenario please fill us in literally and figuratively on who you think the best case scenario is for that receiver position for penn state football opposite of Jahan dotson well now i'm not sure because i know who i think it's gonna be okay and I think it's going to be Cam Sullivan Brett. Right. Um, is that the best thing for the program long term? Maybe not. I mean, I certainly I think that there's, and this is a rabbit hole we don't want to go down, but there's an option for a sixth year for him, um, right? Based on the NCAA, you know, rules. Uh, and it, and he's a guy who was thought to have had potential previously. So again, I mean, I'm kind of, kind of taking this from those prior instances. Now, maybe best case is Malik Mega, right? Right. Maybe, right? So like, yeah, if he, if Malik was great and broke out this preseason and, and was spectacular, he's got the body, he's got the size. He's got the talent. Does he have the consistency? I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if you, I think if you had to draw up, hey, how does this thing play out the best for Penn State, the program this year and into the future? Yeah, it would be it would be really good for him and for Penn State if 
he was a guy who asserted himself and and took that job. But uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, I think again, like this is this is stuff that's happening as we're as we're speaking. So right. until we actually see the evidence of that, and until we see the evidence of it happening in games, you know, I I'm going to lean towards the okay. Well, what's the best chance for them to win right now? The best chance for them to win right now is Cam Sullivan Brown being as good as they thought he was going to be last preseason. Uh, yeah, and 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 that is uh, truthfully his ability to again is a completely unknown. I don't know that you can have a guy who can have a bounce back, breakout, and comeback season all at the same time. Unlike uh, Cam Sullivan Brown, he could have all of those this year. Uh, I I'm gonna predictably go in a different direction. And while I, I think you may have some really valid points on the offensive line that I may be overlooking, I do think that this one is realistic. And, and Malik Mega is a, great, is a great guy to bring up, but I, I, I do think that Keandre Lambert-Smith is the best case and a realistic scenario. And a guy that has the, um, the situation from last year where he did get those starting reps, we did see more struggles from him from sort of a mental uh, standpoint of adjusting to the college football game that Parker Washington didn't have. But those presumably shouldn't be a problem this year. And the best case scenario, while, while you're right, it is Malik Mega in this sense, and this is why I want to bring up these two guys, and I'm glad you did bring up Mega is that you need to have a deep presence outside of Jahan Dotson. You need to have a guy that has big play potential. And Keandre Lambert-Smith has the length and he has the movement skills, maybe not the top end speed, but it's more. It's about more than that when it comes to just being able to get deep. One of those two guys, I think, is the best case scenario when it comes to being that boundary receiver because Cam Sullivan Brown is, in some ways, maybe a slightly bigger version of Jahan Dotson. And you can still win with that. Yeah. And you can still be a good football team that has a lot of really good pieces, maybe that aren't dynamic and that don't have that big play potential. But if you want to be great, and this is if you want the best case scenario, you do need some big play guys. And as much as Noah Kane is a big play guy in a sense, there's not a lot of high end speed and size combination. And Mega, you're right, is by far the best answer there. But I think a, a, a realistic one, because it's pretty hard, I would have a hard time assuming Mega is going to be able to do that this year. So I'm going with Keandre Lambert Smith. Other, uh, just to put a button on that, I do think that the best case scenario for Penn State on the uh, tackle position is if Landon Tangwall becomes a good right tackle and he doesn't have to kick into guard. Because again, I was reading today, I was reminded of this when I was reading the uh, latest issue of Blue White Illustrated Penn State has a Harvard lineman set to join them in 2022. They've done some pre-work in the transfer portal, bringing in a six foot six, two hundred and ninety pound offensive lineman. Which that sounds a lot like a left tackle to me. I know that it's super early, but if you're looking at Rasheed Walker, who is not going to be here next year, and you're planning for the future, if you can start to put those pieces in place, and maybe it changes over time, I do think that that would be a good situation that you have guys that have the right body types and abilities in those positions. So that's just my last thought on the offensive line, and I wanted to bring that up because A, I get to promote the magazine, and B, I thought it was interesting. Let's go to that running back position behind Noah Kane. What is the second player on this list for you? Because this the, we're going to get to three here, so we're going to knock these out one, two, three. What is it to you that is going to make the second player stand out, and who do you think it's going to be? Um, good question. I mean, I think it's Lee. Uh, I, I think that's who it will be. Uh, is that the thunder and lightning situation, or is it thunder and thunder? Um, that's a lot of that's a that's a lot of rumble thunder, <laughs> right? So I don't know. I, I mean, I yeah, I I know you love Kazaya. Uh, and I think that he's got to be in the mix there. I, it, it'll be interesting to me because you saw, you saw obviously, um, you know, a progression and a development at the end of Kazai's true freshman year that you think it provides an opportunity to springboard him into this season. And I think that that's true. I just think that the question is, why haven't these guys necessarily taken the next step 
right? And, and right. not to say that they, right. they not to say that they aren't taking steps. They are. They're, they come in with a lot of potential, a lot of, um, you know, good optimism, right? About right. what they can do moving forward. It's just a question of okay, um, all right, they got a spring practice, they got a winter workout, they they. They're, they had a full summer. They, they still get to come in here and no Kane hasn't played football absent one game in really 18 months. More. Right. Right. 20, 20 months, 22 months. Um, so if, if somebody is going to beat him, you would think that it would be one of those two guys. And I don't think that that has happened yet. And so, yeah, I don't, I'm not, I'm not real sure. I mean, I, I do. I do think that it's um, something that they have to sort out and figure out. This preseason is do, and I'm repeating myself from the last time we talked. But do you have a one, and then two A B C, right? That you're trying to figure it out. Yeah. Or do you, or do you have a one A one B and a two A two B? I'm not. I'm not exactly sure how how they. You know. Or again, like. One A B C, maybe that's it. Um, yeah. And so I think that I think that they have a lot of options there. It's just a matter of who's going to show this preseason that they have that they've made that step that they that they are there and ready and reliable and consistent to to, to fulfill that role. So yeah, I mean I'm 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 I'm, uh, I'm bulking here, but I'm gonna go back to. Lee just because I think that he has shown it and that's a big thing for them Yeah, (laughs) is, is being, you know, having demonstrated that you can fulfill that role. So we'll see. Yeah. So it it is, again, it's interesting of uh, you're definitely going for consistency and I, you know, when, when the best case scenario is your two most talented players that are the two that we've seen best, do take that next step. You're right. If you have two guys that are bruising backs that get yards after the carry consistently and make things happen on their own, that is the best case scenario. To me, you know, I, I'm, I've am i always wanted to be a GM, right? So I've always looked at the scouting stuff, all of that stuff. So I've looked at things from kind of more of the macro view than just the uh, that part of the picture. And that, that does provide us different perspectives. And to me, what I want to know is how does this team work now and how do you keep as many talented players as possible now this obviously you're bringing in running backs every single year but you don't want to lose talented football players and with John Lovett I think that I've looked at this position not only as you know the long-term view but also when it comes to specifically what are the skill sets they're bringing to the table and how do those balance is Noah Kane the best pass protector uh on the team we haven't seen any evidence of that. He was not the best pass protector as a freshman. Now, he's a much more much more mature player. He could be. Is he the best receiving back? We don't know that. I do know that John Lovett was a good receiver and a good pass blocker. So if you want to have a change of pace back that has different skills, I would say the best case scenario is John Lovett, and then Kevon Lee operates as basically a 1B. And you've got those three guys interchanging carries, and then Lovett is your number two. So that way you keep everyone involved that needs to be involved, and then it really becomes that fourth running back. Do any of those guys push John Lovett? Do any of those guys push for that position? That's where you can have Keziah Holmes come up and make those plays, and he can be that explosive player to complement what you've got going on. But to me, if you're talking about, and again, we'll go realistic best-case scenarios, because best-case scenario, you're right, I think is Keziah Holmes takes over that John Lovett role, but there's a reason they brought him in. There's a reason they wanted him on yep. this roster. They need that skill set, and they need his veteran presence in order to to make sure that they have competent play in those key positions, which the young guys have been inconsistent with. So that's kind of my take on I think we kind of agree here, but it, it's just a little bit different of how you look at the distribution of work at that position. Yeah, the, the, the one guy that for whatever reason, nobody seems to talk about, but I mean, if we're looking at, at best case scenarios for, for Penn state, I I think that certainly getting something relevant and useful and consistent out of Devin Ford would absolutely qualify 
for this team this season, right? I mean, here's a guy who went through some stuff last year. There, there were some situations last year that he was put into that, you know, as a as a true sophomore expecting going into the season to be the third back, you know, coming out off the bench to be thrust immediately into what was really a starter's role on the road at Indiana to start the season, you know, that, that was, um, you know, that was something that, that I I don't think he was prepared for. I think he would acknowledge that he wasn't prepared for it and he did the best that he could, but with another year of seasoning and those experiences now in his back pocket. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think certainly there's, potential there for Devin Ford, who, if you look at his numbers, um, they're actually not that bad. Uh, you, you know, they're, they're actually, um, he had some productivity last season when he had the opportunities um, to play, but obviously he had, you know, some of his own off the field, um, you know, uh, challenges and adversities that, that hit his life that kind of upended that a little bit towards uh, the middle of the season. So, yeah, I mean, you know, coming back this year, mature, wiser, all of those uh, intangibles, along with what you would expect is the gradual and necessary progression of a third-year guy in the program. Sure, I, I, I think that there's uh, some potential there for him as well. So who is, if if we're rounding out this depth chart, and, and three deep is important at that position, who's the third guy that you're saying is the best-case scenario for Penn State to go along with Kevon Lee and Noah Kane for you? Yeah, I mean, I, certainly I think that, that Ford would qualify as that. I mean, look, like, I, I don't think that there's necessarily a wrong answer here, right? Uh, you, you brought John Lovin in for a reason. You, you want Kaziah Holmes to, to stay and be engaged and be active. And I think that you want Devin Ford to find a role, right? I, I mean, I think that Devin Ford had some opportunities in the kick return game, um, you know, that that would be relevant, right? And so – right. Yeah, I, I, right. It, like uh, there, there are lots of options there for Penn State. It's a matter of figuring out who are the three. Cause they detailed it last week. Who are the three? If if that's the ideal is to get the three. Who are the three that stand out? And are are there any other things uh, and roles that the other two guys can fulfill? Because and James Franklin said it, and you know I, I don't even think it's a knock on wood situation, but running back somebody's going to get hurt. Yeah, almost yep. almost a guarantee. So you better have four guys who can play because even if your ideal is wanting three, uh, as soon as somebody gets nicked up and has to miss some time, you're going to start to rely on that fourth. So it's just a matter of figuring out who it is this preseason. So you've already put in uh, Brenton Strange at that tight end position just quickly because we spent about 30 minutes here on the offense, and I think there are more conversations yeah. to be had about the defense uh, what yeah. do you see in that in that situation? Do you see that as a co-starter role, or what's your thought on the best case scenario for how the tight end is used this year? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that it's Brenton Strange, uh, but I don't think that that precludes Theo Johnson from having a pretty significant role. And from what we saw in the opportunities that we had to watch these guys this spring, um, you know, Tyler Warren can play. Uh, you know, I don't think that there's any question that they have three tight ends who they feel pretty good about uh, at that position. I mean, that, that's the one, you know, pounding the drum, uh, the steady the steady beat this offseason has yeah. been how strong they think that they are at tight end, um, you know, which suggests to me, look, I, I'm going to leave the two tight end stuff to you. You can. You, you can uh, dissect and, uh, you know, provide an analysis on on how much you want to go to that and, and what its advantages and disadvantages are. Um, right. Certainly, I think if, if this is an offense that wants to stretch the field, that might not be something you want to overly rely on. Mm-hmm. But they definitely have they definitely have options there. There are definitely um, there are definitely players who can who can both block and, and, you know, be a threat in the receiving game. So, yeah, I, I, I'm going to go with Brian Strange just because he has the experience. He's the guy who, you know, stepped up there. Uh, I think his blocking, you know this as well as anybody, has to get better, has to improve. Yeah, but, for sure. Right. Uh, but overall, you know, you're looking at experience. He's a guy who's got 
three more years to play at Penn State. And so, yeah, it, it, you know, in terms of the the youth movement and priming guys for the futures and their careers, all three of those guys really have an opportunity to contribute now and in the future for Penn State. I, I've had a hard time with that particular situation because I, I, I think it might be the most talented tight end room in the country, and that's with me knowing zero about any other tight end room in the country. But when you've got yeah. three guys that run sub four six or around there, and that are in the two fifty to two sixty realm, I, I do think you might be able to do some field stretching things, especially vertically through the seam with some of those guys if you want to. Uh, it, it does depend because there are different body types in that group. I don't think you want to put Theo Johnson in the backfield. Maybe you want to put yep. Brent Strange back there. He can do a little bit there from a mix and match sort of perspective to give you that sort of unpredictability. Uh, so that I, I think that is going to be a strength of the team. And Mike Yersich, uh, who has never really used tight ends the way that we've seen here in the past, maybe he will do some more of that because as James Franklin said he's never from what he's seen of Mike Yersich he's never seen a scheme he didn't like and didn't want to install so if it goes to looking at film of two tight end situations I think Penn State's in pretty good hands I want to take a quick break before we get to the defense because here's an awesome offer BWI fall camp special going on right now use the promo code BWI60 to get two months free now Nate I don't know about you but I was trying to do the math and uh, we're halfway through August, and that's going to put us, like, what, week 10 of the season? Like, you're basically getting the entire season with that promo code. Uh, yeah, I'll go with that, sure. <laughs> I mean, I, two, 60 days is two months, so it would be, like, week six, Weeks. Oh, so... Yeah, you, you overshot yeah. that just a little bit, but I don't listen. I don't want the details to get too much. Okay, <laughs> get the sixty days free. Let's go. It's gonna be a great time. You're gonna enjoy it. I'm gonna enjoy it. We're all gonna enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, finally, football back to some semblance of normalcy. I can't wait. Yeah, and, and if you want, if you want in depth insider information from Nate, you got to sign up to be a, a, a Rivals member, to get that on the message boards. If you want my post-game analysis articles, those aren't... The, the, you've got to be a subscriber to go get those. So you can get those awesome uh, in-depth breakdowns, the inside information, the inside recruiting information from Greg Pickle and Ryan Snyder, all if you subscribe. I'll put it up one more time for good measure. BWI60, your promo code for two months free. Okay, let's get on to our next section of the team. We're going to go on to the defense. So let's uh, come down here on our little chart that we have. You know, little is always such a word that always feels derogatory. Like we, we call things little and it's like, ah, well, it's just that little thing over there when we uh, we've got this wonderful chart here. And I'm this Nifty. is what this is Crafty. what's called. <laughs> this is what's called vamping because the. Uh, the technology is being rather slow. There we go. Okay. So now we're looking at what we think is are, are the pretty locked and loaded positions for Penn State football. Both corner positions are locked and loaded. Nick Tarburton uh, is – uh, this, I believe, is yours, right? So you're saying Nick Tarburton is for sure the locked-in starter out, uh, opposite of Arnold Abikidi. Yeah, that's how, that's how it appears to be shaping up. And what is it Should about? I say more about that? I mean, I, you know, I think it's a. So it's why? A bit of... So that's a, that's the question, though. Uh, in in yeah. sort of this best case scenario, why is having Nick Tarbert in the best case scenario for Penn State at that position when there's you know the other guys that we'll get to here in a second talking about their skills and and what is it about Tarbert and that makes this a positive thing for Penn State to be the best case scenario? I think that one of the things that is maybe a little undervalued or undersold when talking about this group is the necessity of consistency, uh, maturity, right? Like you got a lot of young players, a lot of green young right. players, right? So guys, right. guys who not only are young age wise, but even if they have a few years in the program, just haven't been on the field all that much, haven't been through it. Uh, and, and absolutely Nick Tarburton doesn't exactly 
buck that trend because of all the time that he's missed due to injury. But he's just an older guy. His, right. his the way he carries himself, the way uh, at least and, and again, like that's not what I know of him. That's what everybody is publicly saying about him is is that is one of the things that he brings to that room. And if you look at that room and some of the uncertainty that exists there, not just a defensive end, but even a defensive tackle. Right. You, you want right. to be able to rely on and and have play up to the level that you're expecting guys like PJ Mustafer, guys like Nick Tarburton that helps that that is that is something that isn't just about you know uh, making splash plays and and racking up sacks I don't expect Nick Tarburton to lead the Big Ten in sacks this season but if he able to stay healthy based on everything that's been said about him over the offseason He's a guy who can provide, again, like, I keep going back to consistency, but it, it is the flashing red light to me. We, we talked earlier. Is it because last year was so bad? Is it because last year was so inconsistent? Correct. Okay. Correct. Right? Like, that's, yeah. if, if, again, like, if I'm looking at flashing red lights, we talked all the way at the beginning of this about how I, I wrote about, you know, the things that existed this year or that they want to exist this year that they didn't exist last year consistency was one of the biggest parts of it. it and and some not of anyone's fault right it just it was such an inconsistent year from start to finish uh they they had some of it by the by the end of the season but at the beginning of the season it, it was just wildly all over the place in terms of what you were going to get from play to play and that's that's the deal, right? Is like right. it only takes on a defense, it only takes a guy or two not being accountable, right? On right on one on one play, uh, you know, it, these are obviously football concepts that you can dive into better than I can. But I, I mean, I remember some of the conversations that we used to have about Penn State's offensive line and how if you actually graded each individual player for the duration of a game, they might only be off a handful of plays, right? Right. Uh, right. You you can you can grade out well, right? But if you've got if you got five offensive linemen who have four mishaps a game and they all happen at different times, that's uh twenty plays. Yeah. Right? That's twenty plays in a game where you're susceptible and it and it creates problems. And the, yep. the same concepts, the same uh issues exist on the defensive side of the ball. And so that's a, a long way around to Nick Tarburton, but I think that's what they're hoping he can provide is a guy who's not gonna get uh outwitted. You know, right. a guy who's not gonna not gonna who's break. not gonna make mistakes. A guy that is going Correct. to be a solid player. He may not get you the high upside, big time wins, but he's not going to make mistakes. I talked about that with Jair Brown and knowing the offense that, or the defense this year. Of he was yep. making some some coverage busts because he was not familiar with the defense yet. He hadn't practiced it. So this yep. year, that's not a problem. And to, to your point about the offensive line or some of these consistency uh, issues. This has always stuck with me. I, I had a music teacher in high school, and he said, we're just going to play one of our warm-up things. And it was just one of the things, and everybody played along. And he said, okay, now this time around, I want you to intentionally make a mistake, one mistake, at any point in the song. And you just heard how horrible it was, and that's how football kind of is, where it's, yeah. it's, this, it's this intricate dance, and if you are not in tune, if you aren't playing the right notes at the right time, it can all get really ugly really quickly. The good news is that, you know, unlike in music, you can have somebody who's just so much better uh, that they can kind of make up for some of the other notes that don't make a whole lot of sense in the situation. So again, I do think that this is an interesting trend, and, and what I was kind of hoping would happen between the two of us is that uh, that would be the, kind of the differentiation for you and I of what is best case scenario. So for me, I still think that when you go to Nick Tarburton and when you're when you're looking at that defensive end position, I do think that that is a uh, a fair place to start. And I, I'm gonna go I'm gonna advance the football here just a little bit uh, on the conversation. 
with uh, Tarburton. But then I think right after that, you've got to have uh, somebody that has that pass rushing upside because you can be as good as you want, but if you don't have the pass rush, that secondary can't hold up for that long. So Smith Vilbert better be bringing something to the table this year because if he's not, then I don't know where the high upside pass rushing is going to come from for this team. That, to me, is really an issue because Penn State has been living on that sort of pass rushing ability and that sort of collective effort at the defensive end position. I do think you're right. Nick Tarburton is going to be a, a, a staple of this defense. He's going to be maybe the early down guy or a power sort of edge rusher. But if you don't have anybody that's getting you pass rushing and that is affecting the quarterback then you're in a big you're you're in a hole from a defensive perspective unless you can scheme up some other stuff which brings us to Jesse Lucada hmm. he's going to play right so he's going to play this season between linebacker and edge defender are you putting him at both positions where where do i write Jesse Lucada tell me where to put him on this depth chart it's a great question. I mean, I I think that they've have been fairly forthcoming. I think Brent Price said it at preseason media day that he he is going to play both, but where he ultimately plays the most will be dictated not just by his own performance, which yeah, first and foremost, which one does he perform the best at? Right. What, right. You're you're trying right. I, I mean, you're talking about a guy who. Uh, Miss the spring, and so that element or that trial period for him to pick up defensive end where he had not played it before, he lost that. He, he he didn't have access to that. So that's the first thing. And then also, how how do the other positions shape up? Uh, what does Ellis Brooks do at at Mike linebacker? Because Jesse's a Mike, right? If if, if he's a linebacker, he's a Mike. Yep. Uh, now, maybe ultimately you're going to say, no, he's not. He's a defensive end. Uh, that's fine. But is he bought in on defense? Like, you just – sometimes I feel and, – and this is not unique to, to Jesse Lucetta, and it's not like it's a Penn State issue necessarily. But sometimes you see these these guys without home, right? Yeah. Who have yep. – who have ability and who have you know that they're they're bringing something they're they're too good to not be on the field, but wrangling what they do best. One, you might not have that opportunity uh, because someone else is a little bit better than them at their most natural position. Um, but also, yeah, where, where is he needed? Right. Is he right. needed as a defensive end? It, it, does that defensive end group need a, a person of his skill set or is he just better than Ellis Brooks? Right. I right. Mean, or or Tyler Elston. Right. I mean, you, you've got other options there at Mike Linebacker. Which one of those guys do you want to be on that role or in that spot most of the time? And what I think that you see is Penn State's going to have some options in All right, let's say let's say Ellis Brooks wins the starting mic job. He's not going to be on the field for every play. So right. when he's not on the field, now you can shift Luketa into that role. Or conversely, maybe Luketa is the mic. Maybe he's the starting mic, and Ellis Brooks is is playing backup. But now you have an option where you can throw something into the mix that can confuse or shake up what offensive coordinators are doing by saying, right. okay, well you have to account for Jesse Lucetta as your starting Mike, but, and he's going to, he's going to get 50% of those reps, you know, kind of like we were talking about Koa Farmer and uh, Michael Parsons. Maybe, maybe it's an actual even split between Ellis Brooks and Jesse Lucetta. And when Lucetta is not on the field as a Mike, you, you can flip him in there as a defensive end and, and keep him on the field and have him do something that he's good at, uh, but also, um, you know, uh, basically fulfill the potential that your defense has. So, yeah. I, I don't, you know, I, I, again, I mean, that's that's what this, this time of year is for. That's what these practices are for, and they're going to have to figure that out. So um, I'm filling out your depth chart for you, and from what it sounds like, you you think that Jesse Lucada is going to be primarily a linebacker. Uh, in, in this in this 
third defensive end position, give me a name. Who is who? Do you think is the best case scenario for Penn State to be? Let's go behind Arnold Evakiti. Who do you think is is yeah. is as that pass rushing specialist? Who's the other guy that is going to be a part of this rotation that you think is the best case scenario for Penn State? Um, I'll I'll say Smith Vilbert. I think I think Penn State would love it if Zariah Fisher became a consistent piece to that right. puzzle as well. Uh, right. Like in terms of wish list, based on what his skill set is, if they could get that out of him every down, uh, I think that that that's something that, yeah, they Penn state would like to see that happen. Um, it's just a matter of whether or not it will. And, you know, it, I think if we're being honest about appearances smith vilbert is more ready for that right now than zariah fisher would be um and so that's he, he would get that first that first nod i think so this is where i think you and i are going to have probably our biggest divergence because when it comes to this situation i i don't know what to do with jesse lucetta because yeah. here's my concern and you kind of laid it out perfectly of, is Ellis Brooks going to step up and take that Mike linebacker position? Because the to me, that the only role I really understand from what I've seen of Jesse Lucada is that he is a good box linebacker. He is a middle linebacker. He is the guy that's going to stop the run. He is not. The reason he, we're talking about him in these pass rushing situations as a possible part-time edge defender is because he is that bad in coverage. So I, from a best case scenario, I don't want him seeing any snaps in coverage unless it's as a zone blitz and he's dropping off from the edge position. I don't think that that's a valuable thing for Penn State to have him out there in coverage situations. Also, is he a defensive end or is he a blitzer? This is the kind of conversation that the NFL had about Micah Parsons. Can you play him full-time at edge or is this really more about what he does as a blitzer lined up uh, in sort of special circumstances? Maybe you line him up over a guard or a center and he gets a quick win or he is smashed up against a tight end or a running back, but you don't know that he can play against tackles on a full-time basis. To me, I have never seen Jesse Lucada be an effective edge rusher. So I don't really want to put him at either position. So that leaves him to, as a as a one or two down player who I don't you talk about not having a home. I I really I don't even know what the role is for him other than a situational blitzer and if it's only coming on the field to blitz then you kind of have tipped your hand as to what he's doing. So I I mean I'm going to put him at defensive end and and this is more of you're trusting Brent Pry and James Franklin that they've seen more than you have when it comes to his ability as a defensive end. But from everything we've heard, he's playing more at that linebacker position. But then that opens up the door for Tyler Elsden, who I thought played very well this spring and I was impressed with. And then James Franklin conf confirmed that in his spring practice uh, press conference after, after the scrimmage. Because Elsden has... I, I, I kind of figured this out this week of why I liked him. He reminds me of, um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting his name. Number 40, uh, plays fullback now. Help me out here in the NFL. Um, Jason Cabinda? Jason Cabinda, thank you. Always love talking to Jason Cabinda. He reminds me of Jason Cabinda because he's got that explosive twitchiness, but he might, again, he might not be a great coverage player, but he definitely has more range than Jesse Lucada does. And if I'm profiling what I want out of a Mike linebacker in this system, it's maybe not the best coverage player in the world, but somebody that isn't going to hurt you. And Elsden is kind of rounding into that form of maybe what Ellis Brooks, what I thought Ellis Brooks would be early in his career, but maybe a little bit faster. That's what I'm thinking of when I think of, of Tyler Elsden and what he can provide this team. And he can only provide that if Jesse Lucada is not taking snaps at that position. So for me, the best case scenario is that Lucada does have some edge rushing abilities. He splits yep. that early and late down stuff, and he truly is that hybrid player, but he's primarily an edge rusher so that Tyler Elsden has a role on this team. Because otherwise, I think you've got a massive vulnerability 
as a coverage linebacker from Jesse Lucate. I don't think you can. I don't think you can play him uh, in coverage and say that that's a win for you. The reason we've been talking about in this way is because of that problem. So that's, I guess that's how I see this breaking down a little bit differently. And, and then that allows you to take your time with Zariah Fisher and give him more time to acclimate to the defensive end position and gives him a little bit more leeway to grow and develop. So I think that's an important factor for me. If we move yeah, on to the... That's, that's fair. If we move on to the cornerback position behind Joey Porter Jr. and Tariq Castrofields, there's there's Marquise Wilson still plays corner for this team as much as we talked about that he still plays corner what's the best case scenario at this position for the Nittany Lions and we'll get even give Curtis Jacobs his spot behind in that slot position of when they're not in uh their base package we'll we'll have the, the player behind him also be you know that slot player that they're going to determine in the future yeah um I mean that well you want to start with corner or yeah, start or with corner. Behind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, obviously, Kalen King was a story uh, through the spring. It, 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 look, if you're going to get interceptions, and that's a thing, and that's a thing that you desperately need, and he's a guy that can do it, then sure, right? Johnny Dixon, um, you know, uh, Daquan Hardy. Uh, you, you know, you got the transfer from Florida State, like. <laughs> there there are no shortage of options for them uh in in again like yeah it seems pretty clear that the two starters are i don't want to say written in stone but, but yeah those jobs appear to be filled now right. it's figuring out how how do you make the best of what you got waiting in the wings and it, you know it seems pretty clear that king has to play um and so that that would be to me, again, not just not just right now, but into the future. Yeah, you want to get this guy in the field, and uh, you want to get him those reps early. Yeah, and it because it everything that you and I have been hearing about, it's that it, getting the vibe that he's a three year player, right? Unless something yep. goes terribly wrong. So this is that situation of do you want to redshirt a guy, or are you wasting his redshirt because he's only going to play those two years afterwards? And Kalen King has that sort of vibe right now, so. Uh, then it becomes that other position, and then this is where I think the slot position also comes into play, where Daquan Hardy did a good job last year, but is he the ideal of what they're looking for? Can he be beat out just because he's not big enough and they want a f more physical body? Like, if Kalen King at 5'11 goes in there, he's he's clearly a bigger, better coverage player from a physical standpoint than Daquan Hardy, or is Hardy going to maintain that position? What's the best outcome for you with this other corner, this fourth cornerback position? And then if that does, how does that translate to the slot? Yeah, I mean, I think I think for the fourth cornerback position, I think Johnny Dixon makes sense. Um, yeah. I, I think that he's a, a guy, again, who it was kind of the same situation as King in that you, didn't, you don't exactly know what you're going to get right off the bat with these guys who are new to the program, but they made an immediate impression, both of them. And so, yeah, if you can, if you can fulfill that, then that does open up what your options are uh, for kind of that slot corner uh, situation, right? Um, you, you have different players that you can play with. I think that they have, again, like, like you just said, there's a decent number of guys who can do both, who, yeah. who have the ability, who are not going to be necessarily pigeonholed into, into one thing. I think the fact that Hardy has the experience doing it, that that counts for something. That, right. right? I mean, and, and they seem to be satisfied and seem to be pretty pleased with uh, what his performance was there when he did have those opportunities last year. But, you know, last year, again, was so messed up from every perspective, but especially from the corners perspective, right? They, they just, uh, they were not healthy. They were not yeah. healthy last year. Yep. At one point, I, I don't remember exactly the game, but I, I think Brent Pry said that they had two and a half healthy corners. <laughs> you know, for That's for a great a way to put two. that. That sucks. <laughs> that's tough, right? That's not what, that's not the situation that you want to be in. So, um, you know, is it, are, are you grading based on how somebody performed in an absolute necessity situation or are you grading 
how they performed just on its own. Right. And I don't, right. I don't know exactly the answer to that. Um, you know, so again, that's, that's something to figure out this preseason. It, it's, and this is the part where I have the hardest problem as well, because I see a lot of talent and I want to use all of it. And I don't want Daquan Hardy on the bench if I'm Penn state, because he played yeah. very well. Like I don't want to understate what he did as a slot corner because he was very good in coverage the problem is when he wasn't in coverage when when the when the defense or uh, when the offense decided they were going to run the ball and he was in the slot or he was on the boundary he did not hold up the way that you might want from that position and Penn State has typically had a physical presence in that slot and by the way this position could also be a safety Penn State has been very well, flexible in how they use who covers the slot and I was just I was just gonna bring up that I'm pretty sure Brent Price said in the spring that Brisker was an option there. That that was some that was a thing that Brisker could could fulfill as well. I mean, and obviously Keaton Ellis, right, is the natural yeah. yep. one that makes the most sense. I don't think again, uh, you can talk a, a, a symphony on this, but Jaquan Brisker wants to stop the run and sack the quarterback, right? Like, that's that's yeah. his deal. I don't think he wants to be in coverage, um, but he can do it. And if we're, again, looking at some of the situations that they have to figure out at safety, maybe that's the way that you get Jonathan Sutherland on the field. Right. right? If, if he's a guy who you need to get on the field. So, um, yeah. you know, it, uh, again, like, I, I think – Ultimately, we're talking about things that you know you're going to see this at some point, right? Like, all of these guys are going to play. They're going to get onto the field. It's just a matter of how much and, and what are the choices that, that Penn State feels best uh, accentuate what these guys can do. I, I want to, and I've talked about this quite a bit, of putting Johnny Dixon in the slot as well from a third and long perspective. I'm typically thinking about, and, and we agree you know, lock step about who the boundary corners are and kind of that pecking order. But to me, I, I want to use Penn State has had a boundary corner that's flexed into the slot and given them good reps in the past, you know, from John Reed, Grant Haley did it from time to time. I, I, I'm trying to find the guy that can do that. Kalen King is the body type, you would think, but he's still a true freshman. Johnny Dixon, I to me, is the guy that I really want to put here. But you're right. And, and when I asked about this position, Brent Pry said, well, Daquan Hardy is our slot guy. So that, that to me, that means until proven otherwise, he's going to be the slot corner and they're just going to rotate who's playing at that boundary position. So we're, we're going to we're going to end up here in the same spot. But I, I don't I don't know that I really think Jaquan. I really like what Jaquan can do from a coverage perspective. It may not be his best strength. Obviously, his best strength is being in the box and, and being a physical presence. But if you're going to be a safety, you've got to be able to do... You've got to be able to cover deep. And that is one area I, I don't know that... I want to put his body type and his skill set one-on-one in the slot. Maybe with some players, maybe some matchup situations. But I think him roaming over top of the box, being the guy that cleans everything up, that's the best place for him where he can react and go make breaks on the ball. The guy next to him, let's open this can of worms. Let's talk about uh, what we're going to get out of that other safety position. Best case scenario, who is starting next to Jaquan Brisker? Um, take Brown. All right. That's a good. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I agree with that as well. He has age, maturity. He's he makes plays on the ball. He was a breakout in the spring for a reason, you know. And and so yeah, if you're doing if you're doing best case scenario, it's that you can get that fit for that position that they didn't have last year. Uh, and and make the most of it. And yeah. he seems he seems to be that compliment. Like, because that's really what we're talking about here is Jaquan Brisker was not a compliment to Lamont Wade. Lamont Wade was where Jaquan Brisker probably should have been. 
but right. they were two guys who had similar skill sets and similar strengths and they wanted Lamont to be on the field. Yep. Uh, now you don't necessarily have to do that. You, you have a situation where uh, Brown's strengths are complementary to Frisker's. And so they don't do the same thing. They're not the same player. And so now you can finally put Jaquan where he's best and where he feels the most comfortable, but also have a player behind him who is most comfortable there, who right. wants to be playing center field. Right. right. And that, I mean, that's the whole, that's the whole thing is you, you, you want to have a guy back there who, who doesn't feel like a fish out of water, which if you talk to Jaquan Brisker and I did over the off season, that was really what, the, the whole thrust of that interview was he never felt comfortable. He right. never felt right. that wasn't what he feels good about doing. Uh, but, you know, to help the team, that that was the role that he had to fulfill uh, yeah. at that time. And yeah, so now, He fooled me. He, I mean, honestly, yeah. he fooled me. He was making plays from that position by the end of the season. So, you know, making breaks on right. the ball. That's why when you, when you mentioned that a couple minutes ago, I, I that was one area I was I, I was looking forward to seeing if he can take a step forward and really becoming that sort of all around safety that you can you can deploy anywhere and that really is what we've been talking about with him. So you're right when you have J or Brown, a guy that doesn't have similar skill sets, you do have the yin and the yang, and that's really even last year. That's what I think they were hoping for, right? Was that you would have yep. Brisker and Wade playing the same position, and Jair Brown being that other guy. He just simply wasn't ready without practice to be a part of the defense and take significant snaps as the season went on. Yeah, I mean, how are you supposed to do that as a JUCO transfer? Right. Who, you know, right. like you, you don't set foot on practice and then practice in, you know. July and August was not practice, right? So, I mean, it just, he started the season things through the, by the end of the season that he was doing well and then flipped the calendar into the new year. And, uh, you know, by just about every account, they were very, very pleased with how he performed when settling down and settling into that, that opportunity. Uh, he made the most of it. I will just for, uh, good measure. We're going to put Tyler Rudolph here as the third safety in this situation. And again, the the best yep. thing is you can mix and match with these guys. Tyler Rudolph has the physical presence that I think he could play either of those positions. We've heard a good bit about him, the light coming on. One of those young safeties ha does have to step up this year. So let's go back to the man in the middle. We know. I think we know P.J. Mustafer. He's going to be that that nose tackle body type. You've got Fred Hansard, who I think is going to be the guy behind him. So then this this three technique position, the other defensive tackle, best case scenario is um Beeman. All right. The one thing that I one thing that I have I, I know I made a choice there. Uh, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> before we before we leave the secondary. Okay. Keaton Ellis has to be on Keaton Ellis has to be on there. There has to be a place for him. So I don't know. I don't know where that is. It's either that slot corner spot or the safety spot with Brown and Rudolph. Uh, I, I don't know which one it is, but he's going to be at one of those two spots. And so uh, it makes me say, get Hardy out of there. Uh, if I if I have to make a choice, because so these are the hard decisions in the secondary. This is what this is the this is the hard problem of now they're very talented and guys are going to be fighting for these reps. Yeah, and but you, but he I, I just I look at him and he has to be on the field. Yeah, there has there has to be a place for him. Um, and so I, I don't know I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know which spot he's going to win. Uh, if he doesn't win a spot, where he's going to be backing somebody up at, but. He, he's a guy with a skill set that you need to have on the field. That yeah. said, I like Hakeem Beeman. <laughs> I think uh, I think he provides something. Um, you, you know, we've seen this weight thing, and I I don't know what the roster lists him at. Maybe you have that two fifty six as of yesterday, and I thought he was two fifty three yeah. a couple days ago. So literally, it has changed four times this off season. I cannot keep up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that that's light. 
right, from what yeah. they would prefer. Yep. But I also think that Penn State has a history of that, of Kevin Givens, mm-hmm. of um, uh, the name will escape me, Detroit Lions. Anthony Zettel. Anthony Zettel. Yep. Guys, guys who kind of can do a little bit of both. They're not exactly a defensive end, but they're not right. exactly a tackle. Um, you know, yeah, I, I, but you just see how that goes. I mean, I, I'm just not sure what exactly to expect there. I think that obviously, uh, you know, uh, uh, Derek Tangelo out of Duke is, is an option there. Um, you know, you just, you just gotta, you just gotta kind of figure that out. I mean, the way that they, that Penn State as a staff had been kind of presenting the defense as a whole throughout the spring and the off season was finding five, right? Like right, for right. positions, you want you want a two and a half depth chart, and so I don't know exactly how those shake out, um, but you know, I think that you you should feel pretty confident that if whoever's not in the game, whether it's, whether it's Tangelo or Beeman, the other one's going to get a good amount of reps as well. They're both going to play. Um, But yeah, I I think think that you want to see that next step. From, from Beeman. Beeman. Yeah. From Beeman, especially this situation, I think is a little more uh, ticky tack when it comes to, does it matter which one's one and which one's two? Because both guys are definitely going to play. Penn State is is yeah. running four or five deep at that defensive tackle. They're running four or five deep at defensive end. But really, to me, that was the reason those snaps were more interesting is because um, I, there's a higher variance at that position of of guys that can make plays, guys that make specific types of plays. Generally, what you want from your interior players is to stop the run and to get after the pass rusher. This particular situation, why I wanted to bring it up individually, is because it's the one that gets all the one-on-ones. If it, if everything's going right, that, that three-technique defensive tackle gets a lot of one-on-one situations where you can make plays if you're a good pass rusher. And I agree with you that Hakeem Beeman is that guy. I think he can also be a little bit flexible to do you know, only pass downs and be still a very effective player. And Derek Tangelo, I think people are underrating his run stuffing ability. I think if you wanted to and you wanted to go small, you can take PJ Must for off the field, put Derek Tangelo at that two eye position, and then if that's your if that's your third down pass rush package, that's pretty good. You've got a pretty good combo right there. Um, so when it comes to these two, is this a similar situation to the running back position? where you have jobs and maybe not necessarily the depth chart isn't, you know, one, two. It's more about situations and where you line up when you're asked to. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think I think that's a perfect way to put it is can you, do you have the ability to hide your deficiencies and accentuate your strengths and make choices that, given tendencies offensively you know when to have the right guy on the field at the right time right right that's it is is it's odds it's statistics it's you know you're just you're just making bets about types of plays that you're going to be facing in certain situations and the best way to defend them and the more options that you have that are not making the most of a bad situation, but actually making the most of a good situation, the better off you're going to be. Right. Right. I mean, this, right. this isn't rocket science, but that's, that's really what we're talking about here. Um, and so, yeah, if, if, if there is, if, the, if there are scenarios in the game where it, it it's easy to, to, yeah, you want your, you want your personnel to be versatile enough to with, withstand and handle just about every situation that they encounter. But if you have the option of making those rotations and doing it situationally, yeah, that's a great, that's a great place to be. So how do you feel about your final 
uh, depth chart. We're talking about best case scenario. You've got Joey Porter Jr., Tree Castro Fields, Nick Tarburton, PJ Musfer, Hakeem Beeman, Arnold Epikiti, Curtis Jacobs, Ellis Brooks, Brandon Smith, Jaquan Brisker, Jair Brown, and then the key depth pieces you see there. How do you feel about your defense? And then how do you feel about this offense? I'm going to get up here in a second. So how do you how do you how are you feeling about how you did today with your your best case scenarios? Yeah, I mean, I think that you know you're much more qualified than I am. I'm just reading the tea leaves on you know what the coaching staff has said through the off season about these guys. Um, I, I just I feel so uh, uh, there's a flying blind element flying in the dark with no headlight Yeah. based on taking, right. You, you just, you kind of have to take the word for it because I haven't seen these guys play. Most of them play in anything resembling a normal situation in quite a long time. If at right. all, right? right. I've never seen, I've never seen Johnny Dixon play anybody not wearing a white jersey right <laughs> right like right i mean that's it I'm, so uh so yeah it, it's just it's all right this is this is the way that the situation appears to be but we're, we're gonna get such a better feel for that against wisconsin right yep. as soon as penn state plays wisconsin we're gonna know one the choices that penn state made with some of these guys but two, how well the personnel performs within those specified roles, right? Right, and right. and so the as soon as we start to get the, to see those opportunities, they'll say, okay, well, well, here here's what they were deciding between here here you know right like yeah. here, here were the options here were the options this appears to be right like again same situation same same deal of what what are the situations where they're making the most of a bad situation and what are the situations where they're making the most of of a good situation and having depth and having experience um and not just having to um fill in for for something that's not not ideal right and and based on based on what i saw last year so much of last year was Okay, none of this is ideal. Not, right. I'm not not just the, the season, but like three Castro Fields not being available means that corner is not ideal. Right. 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 Like it, it's just it's just dominoes. Not having Michael Parsons means that Jesse Lucetta is playing Will. That's not ideal. Yep. Right. And and on and on down the list of not ideal defensively right and offensively it was the same deal it was right. the same deal it was, it was a lot of the same stuff so you know uh, uh, one of the overarching storyline of this offseason is all right so many of those not ideal situations uh, adisa isaac not ideal right right that's a new one that's a new one but other than that so much more of the roster and the personnel that penn state has is more suited to be treated as an ideal. Right. And it, that's and that's and that's the that's the differentiator. That's what gives them an opportunity to be you would think pretty good this year. Well, I I think that's what we were going for today is to try and find what are those ideal things. Now that we can get back to looking at that. Now we can get back to looking at the ideal stuff. We took a look at it, and uh, I had fun. I, I'm glad you came on today. This was uh, a lot longer than we normally do, but I think this was super awesome, and I love the, that we were able to get into it and, and kind of get some differentiating opinions on what we think the best-case scenario is to start the season. I'll say one last thing about that when it comes to what the depth chart is going to look like versus Wisconsin. Expect there to be at least four linebackers because you're playing Wisconsin. So you're going to have like nine people in the box almost always. So it, yep. you're going to you're going to see you're going to see the Wisconsin game plan and then we might shift to what we might see for the rest of the season. Uh, Nate, just, thanks so just, much for today. Just promise me that you'll delete this video from the YouTube account if everything turns out not the way that we predicted. <laughs> That's all I ask. <laughs> you don't want any record of any of this stuff. 
I, Absolutely not. I do not want to be held accountable for preseason predictions. That would be that's worse. That's a worst case scenario. That's a not ideal. So if if it gets cold take exposed and it goes viral, I will not. I absolutely will not do that. We're riding this one to the moon. Um, okay. But uh, any other way, and yeah, sure, I've got you. I got you covered. <laughs> Well, Nate, thanks so much for coming on today. That does it for the BWI Daily Edition. Uh, We're going to have more from practice this week. Penn State football having uh, training camp. We'll give you more updates from that as we go along on the BWI Daily Edition. For Nate Bauer, I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. As always, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and, of course, to YouTube. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.